Hi folks. Time for our discussion of acquired, also known as adaptive immunity. Okay, so the adaptive or acquired immune response is not present when we're born. It develops in response to our exposure to various kinds of molecules in our environment. Once we have been exposed to something and had um, an initial immune response, this arm of our immune system leads to a much more rapid response after we're exposed to the same pathogen again. In fact, you might not even realize that you had uh, a second infection with a particular kind of bacteria or virus because your immune system knocks it down so fast. So one of the critical things about the adaptive immune response is that the response is very specific to, to the kind of threat that um, is encountered. And when I say specific, I don't mean, holy hell, it's a bacterium or a virus. I mean, it's specific on a sub-molecular level. Two, there are two basic types. One is called cell-mediated immunity that involves primarily T lymphocytes. It's referred to as cell mediated because the cell surface molecules that are problematic for our immune system have to be presented to lymphocytes by one kind of phagocyte or another. Primarily macrophages, but could be a basophil or a neutrophil. Antibody mediated immunity, on the other hand, doesn't require presentation of a piece of the offending pathogen in order to be activated. The B lymphocytes, which are the primary cells, can directly interact with the cell surface molecules of a pathogen. So when our nonspecific defenses fail, this arm of the immune system kicks in but it's also important to remember that essentially as soon as the innate, uh, the second level of the innate immune response begins when you start to have phagocytosis of microbes and inflammatory response, this arm of the third arm of the immune system, the third line of defense kicks in. Okay, so the cells that are involved in adaptive slash acquired immunity are antigen presenting cells, APCs. Those are going to be one kind of phagocyte or another and the T and B lymphocytes. The reason that we have specificity on a molecular level with this arm of the immune system is because T and B lymphocytes have receptors that precisely match components of pathogen cell surface molecules. And you might wonder how you could possibly have enough different kinds of lymphocytes to match any potential pathogen that we might encounter. And the way the system works is that each lymphocyte and has a, a completely different cell surface receptor. There's just a tremendous variety produced, but we only make one, or at least let's think about it that way at this point. We only make one lymphocyte that has that particular kind of cell surface receptor. So we generate millions of different kinds of receptors on the B and T lymphocytes, but we just make one copy of each. If we're exposed to a pathogen whose cell surface molecule matches that lymphocyte receptor, that leads to a huge burst of cell division. For adaptive immunity, we need to be able to tell self from non-self, and that requires understanding antigens, which we'll talk about some more in a second. We have to have a mechanism for generating specific responses that can lead to pathogen elimination. And we also need to be able to account for how our immune system is capable of learning and remembering in response to experience with the environment. What underlies all of those requirements is something that you guys have already learned and 
we're just sort of putting it into a new context now. Every organism has unique cell surface molecules. Sometimes they're called markers. They are usually glycoproteins or glycolipids. Remember, glyco means sugar. So a protein that um, spans the cell membrane that has a sugar group sticking off the outside, or same thing for lipid. And that's what our immune system uses to determine self from non-self. One of the most important of these cell surface molecules are called major histocompatibility complexes. So remember, histo means tissue. Um, and as you'll see, the major histocompatibility complexes, MHCs, underlie our ability to type blood and other tissues in order to donate them to other individuals. One of the reasons why you're more likely to be able to receive a donor organ from someone who's closely related is that the structure of these proteins is genetically determined. Each individual in a sexually reproducing species like our own is going to have a unique major histo set of major histocompatibility complexes. So let's get into the weeds a little bit. Antigens are, are technically are defined as any molecule that can stimulate an immune response. So right in this sense of the word, and this is the original sense of the word, any foreign non-self cell surface molecule would be considered an antigen. And the term antigen comes from antibody generating. In practice, though, of course, things are more complicated than they seem sometimes. In practice, the same term, antigen, is used to describe cell surface molecules that mark our own cells, right? So you, when you're thinking about this, you want to read very carefully to make sure whether folks are talking about self versus non-self antigens. Antigens tend to be fairly large and complex cell surface molecules, and it can essentially be any part of, or even a very tiny part of a cell surface molecule, right? So if we're talking about non-self non-self antigens, they would be fragments of bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites. Um, and if they're self-antigens, they're not going to stimulate an immune response because your body knows, your T lymphocytes know that they mark you. That's why your T lymphocytes go to, to college and grad school in the thymus so they can get that kind of education. Antibodies are the proteins that our B cells produce that have receptors that are specific for different kinds of antigens. All right, and you can see in the in the image here there there are a couple different antibodies. The general structure is a Y-shaped molecule, and the outer part of each molecule allows binding to a specific antigen. Each B cell is only going to make one type of antibody. Okay, so first we're going to talk about cell-mediated immunity and then we'll talk about antibody-mediated immunity. So the basic process for cell-mediated immunity is first you have phagocytosis by a macrophage, a basophil, neutrophil, and after the pathogen has been digested in the phagolysosome, a little tiny, a little tiny pieces of it are transferred to a display molecule, and then that's inserted in onto the surface of the phagocyte. The second thing that happens is that those antigens that the antigen presenting cell are sort of waving around are recognized, bound to by a T cell, a T lymphocyte with a matching, a matching receptor. Once that binding occurs, it activates the T lymphocyte which undergoes clonal expansion. So in this slide, 
you see a cartoon of antigen presentation. So you have phagocytosis, the production of the phagolysosome as the phagosome, that vesicle that's been internalized, is joined to the lysosome, which contains lots of digestive enzymes. And then a little pieces of, let's say, the bacterium are attached to a major histocompatibility protein and then move to the cell surface for presentation to the T cell. That's going to happen either in lymph node or spleen. So in the lymph nodes or spleen, we've got a huge array of T cells, right? Each of which has a different cell surface receptor, right? You can see in the larger cartoon, binding between a T cell with a specific shaped receptor right here and the antigen that's shown to it by the antigen presenting cell. Here, HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. It's another way of describing major histocompatibility complex. So once you have that binding, you have activation of the lymphocyte and clonal expansion. Now this part of the process involves not just sort of standard T lymphocytes, but also helper T cells. And the proliferation of the T cells is enhanced by the presence of those uh, molecules that we talked about in class the other day, the cytokines, which are local signaling molecules. After clonal expansion occurs, you have helper T cells, you have cytotoxic T cells and memory T cells. After, after the T cells have done all of their work, there's a negative feedback cycle and you have apoptosis, which remember means programmed cell death of existing helper and cytotoxic T cells. Uh, the memory T cells hang around so that if you're exposed to the same antigen again, you have an enhanced response. Last but not least, with cell-mediated immunity, we want to talk about suppressor T cells. The, their existence sort of makes sense if you think about it, right? Without a set of T cells that are capable of turning the immune response, the immune response off, you end up having uh, a greater and greater and greater immune response, um, even though the pathogen is no longer present. Um, and although we require it in order to survive, immune responses don't feel particularly good. In fact, your immune response is the reason why you feel crappy when you have the flu. So once you have clonal expansion and you've got a lot of cytotoxic T cells around, you need a mechanism by which they're going to actually take out the pathogens. So you have binding between the receptor on the cytotoxic T cell and the antigen, right? And you have tons of these now because of clonal expansion. And these T cells develop vacuoles that contain molecules called granzymes and perforins. So granzymes are going to form, once they're released, they're going to form a pore in the membrane of the offending cell. And the perforins are going to punch a hole into the cell. Um, and that leads to apoptosis on the part of the pathogen. Antibody-mediated immunity. The process is very, very similar to cell-mediated immunity. Um, you just don't need an additional cell as part of the process because the B cells can interact directly with antigens on the pathogen. The um, antibody-mediated immunity is also sometimes called humoral immunity because the antibodies, the B cells that produce antibodies are floating around in the plasma and release the antibodies into plasma. 
and blood was considered one of the four humors. So B lymphocytes, when they undergo clonal expansion, produce a specialized type of B cell called a plasma cell that makes a particular kind of antibody, um, as well as memory cells um, that are ready to respond to an infection in the future with anti antibody production. So a tiny bit more about antibodies, all right? As I said before, it's a Y-shaped protein, and each antibody has two separate antigen binding sites. And that's part of how they are capable of doing some of the things that they do. Antibodies, when plasma cells produce them, they sort of let them out into the blood plasma, and a single plasma cell can produce tens of thousands of antibodies per second. Once the antibodies are out, they have a couple of different uh, ways of interacting with pathogens. Because they can bind to two separate, two separate pathogens, right, because there are two arms on the antibody, they can essentially lead to uh, clumping of pathogens. And that's a signal to phagocytes that something's going on and that they should go take care of the problem. The other way in which antibodies can be really useful is that if a bacterium, say, produces a toxin um, that can cause destruction of tissue, the antibodies can bind that toxin and that leads to essentially to it becoming inactive. So the basic, as I said before, the basic process is the same. You have activation, which involves B cell with a specific receptor being activated by binding directly to an antigen, either an antigen that's in the plasma or an antigen that's still attached to the pathogen. You have clonal expansion, and that involves cytokines from helper T cells, and that clonal expansion produces lots of plasma cells to produce antibodies as well as memory B cells. After the infection has been taken care of, suppressor T cells help stimulate apoptosis so that you don't have lots of extra plasma cells floating around generating antibodies. So this form of our immune system, the acquired immune system, is capable of remembering the pathogens that we've encountered in the past. And because of that, our secondary response to an infection is much, much faster. So this slide shows you a summary of the different kinds of lymphocytes as well as their functions. Uh, B lymphocytes can differentiate into memory, memory B cells as well as plasma cells that secrete antibodies. T lymphocytes, helper T cells, produce cytokines, and cytotoxic T cells are the destroyers.